jazz to start off our day. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Let us turn to the person behind you from a distance and pass the peace of Christ to them. Great, thank you. Well, welcome everyone to St. Andrew's United Church. I want to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional land of the Tsleil-Waututh and the Musqueam First Nations. And I'd also like you to note that St. Andrew's is an affirming congregation. You have probably noticed our rainbow sidewalk outside when you came in, and that means that's a signal that we welcome everyone to participate in the life and work of this church. No matter your age or stage, no matter who you love, no matter how you identify, no matter if you're rich or poor or where you're from, you are welcome here. Um, some announcements today. First of all, um, we had a mishap with our slides, so we are not going to have the words on the screens today, um, but we'll pause a bit till you can find it in your books in front of you. Um, so there you go, that's the one thing. Um, you'll probably notice that on the back table there, there's our calendars again and our uh, jars of honey from our own honey, honey hive. Um, you can purchase St. Andrew's honey for the ridiculously low price of, <laughs> of $10, a donation of $10, and it helps to keep our bees um, happening year by year. Uh, there are only 34 jars left, so we're making, making good stead there, um, yeah. Um, and Salt of the Earth, a Christian Seasons calendar, is only $15. And this calendar begins on the first day of Advent, Sunday the 3rd, and continues until the Christian New Year on Saturday, November 30th, 2024. So it's a unique calendar put out by um, a local congregation. It unfolds a Christian year through scripture, liturgical color, and artwork. It's quite a beautiful calendar. You should take a look at it. Okay, um, and please pick up a copy of our latest newsletter and e-news at the back um, if you didn't get one in the mail. I know you know you didn't get one there at the back. And other flyers from the information table so that you'll know what's happening in the coming um, few weeks at St. Andrews. So now, let's take a deep breath and sit in silence for just a moment while we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 20, for where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. We light this candle as a reminder that we are not alone. May its flame warm our hearts and inspire us to live the message of the gospel. Holy God, holy immortal one, may this time in worship grant to us strength for life's journey courage for times of suffering, the power of forgiveness, the joy of faith, the freedom of love, the hope of a new life, the vision of unity. And may this time in worship open us to your call to serve. Amen. We come, O oh God, on this day of rest and prayer to worship you. Fill the lamps of our lives with oil and light the fire of your spirit within each of us. May our minds, our hearts, and our bodies be aflame with your love and grace. And may we reach out to friend and stranger alike in your name and with your promise. Through Christ and in Christ, we pray. Amen. Our opening hymn is Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness. We'll give you a minute to take out Voices United, the big red book, and turn to page 375. 
and then I invite you to stand as you are able to sing along.
us bow our heads in prayer as I pray the prayer for healing and renewal. Let us pray. Gracious God, we confess what seems to be always with us, broken things within us that seem never to mend, empty places within us that seem always to ache, things like buds within us that never seem to flower. O oh God of love and grace, help us to accept ourselves, for it is in loving ourselves that we are ennobled to love our neighbor. It is in accepting our shortcomings that we are ennobled to forgive others. It is in accepting our imperfections that we are saved from needing to be perfect. We ask for your forgiveness, O oh God, and pray that you show us how to choose and cherish life. Amen. In the quiet curve of evening, in the sinking of the days, in the silky void of darkness, you are there. In the lapses of my breathing, in the space between my ways in the crater carved by sadness you are there you are there you are there you are there in the between the phrases, in the cracks between the stars, in the gaps between the meaning, you are there. In the melting down of endings, in the cooling of the sun, in the solstice of the winter, you are there, you are there, you are there, you are there, in the mystery of my hungers, in the silence of my rooms, in the cloud of my unknowing, you are there. In the empty cave of grieving, in the dead prophets and parables. Your word can meet us with challenges, a puzzle, or a promise. Send your spirit with the gifts of understanding to grasp the puzzle and to encourage us to take up the challenge and the promise through Christ, your living word. Amen. Our first scripture reading is Psalm 78 from Psalms for Praying by Nancy Merrill. Listen well, O peoples of the earth, 
to inner promptings of the Spirit. Let silence enter your house that you may hear. For within your heart love speaks, not with words of deceit, but of spiritual truths to guide you upon the paths of peace. Do not hide this from your children. Teach of the inward voice and help all generations to listen to the silence, that they may know the beloved and be free to follow the precepts of love. Our gospel reading this morning is on page 28 of the New Testament, and it's Matthew 25, 1 to 13. Parable of the Ten Bridesmaids and the Lamps. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten bridesmaids took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. When the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, all of them became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a shout, look, here is the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise replied, no, there will not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they went to buy it, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding banquet, and then the door was shut. Later, the other bridesmaids came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Keep awake therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Well, this morning we're talking about end times. This happens every year in our lectionary cycle in mid-November. The readings take on a decidedly apocalyptic tone as one church year draws to a close and another one begins on the first Sunday in Advent. Jesus is talking about end times and not just the end of the age or the end of the world. He's talking about his own end time. This story from Matthew's Gospel takes place on the Tuesday or Wednesday of Holy Week just a day or two before Jesus will celebrate his last meal with his disciples on the very night when he will be handed over to those who will kill him. And he knows it. Danger is in the air. He can smell it. He's going away to face torture and death. There's something I think we need to understand about Matthew's gospel. In fact, about all the gospels. The story is always taking place at at least two different levels. On one level, we have the story itself. This is the last week of Jesus' life before he will die on the cross. But there's another level too, the level on which the writer of the story already knows the ending. The writers of the Gospels know that by the power of God, Jesus will beat death that he will be raised up again and live, but then he will be taken up into heaven out of their sight. So on both levels, people are grappling with living in a time when they believe they don't have Jesus in their midst. The question on their minds is, what shall we do while Jesus is gone? Because there is an assumption that he will return. Well, we United Church folks sort of share that assumption. We proclaim it every time we say the, the Apostles' Creed, which is on page 918 of Voices United, and we infer it in a new creed, which we say together on Communion Sunday. But when was the last time we said the 
Gospels or the um, Apostles' Creed. I don't think I, we've said it in the 12 years I've been here. Well, after witnessing to the good news of resurrection and Jesus' presence in heaven with his Father, we say he will come to judge the living and the dead. That's what we say in the Apostles' Creed. And according to our Reformed theology, we expect the return of Jesus as Lord and Judge. But we don't talk a lot about this, maybe because Christians and other denominations talk about it so much and in such a way that it makes us feel uncomfortable. Some Christians seem to expect that Jesus' return will look a lot like the Terminator movies, which would assume that he has undergone a personality transplant at the right hand of the Father. The Jesus of the Gospels who welcomes all, cures all, casts out all demons, feeds all, loves all, that Jesus comes back with guns blazing according to the theology found in books such as Left Behind. Just for the record, that's not not how we view it in the United Church. I'll be very honest with you. I don't know exactly when, what the return of Jesus will look like, and I have no earthly idea when or even if it'll happen. The good news is we're not expected to know those details. In fact, I, spent, I think we spent exactly five minutes, if that, at theological school discussing the return of Jesus. The question is, how shall we await Jesus' return? That's the question. What shall we do while Jesus is gone? These are the questions posed for us in Matthew's gospel story. And Jesus presents this enigmatic parable by way of an answer. There are 10 bridesmaids, literally ladies in waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. Five of them are wise and five are foolish. In Greek, five are prudent and five are morons. The five wise bridesmaids have all procured extra oil for their lamps. Lamps used to welcome the guest of honor, much as we might put lanterns outside our homes at holiday time. The five foolish bridesmaids have no oil. They are unready when the bridegroom finally arrives, and instead of welcoming, welcoming him joyously, they must scramble and find a merchant and buy their oil at the last minute because the other bridesmaids weren't going to share theirs with them. Meanwhile, the bridegroom and the bri wise bridesmaids begin the wedding feast, while the foolish bridesmaids are gone, and then the doors are shut. Well, what will we do while Jesus is gone? What are we doing? How do we await his return? The answer, according to the parable, is we are asked to prepare to wait and to avoid assuming that we have enough oil in our lamps right now. Now, a word about the meaning of oil in ancient times. Oil is used in scripture in myriad ways. Our parable shows us one common uses it for the fuel for lamps. This little light of the bridesmaids, they can only let it shine if they have enough oil. Oil makes it possible for light in the darkness. Another very common use of oil is for cooking, and it still is. Scripture is filled with simple recipes for spread, for stew, for roasted lamb, and oil is often an important ingredient. Oil makes food delicious. The Psalms are filled with images of oil. We pray, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, from Psalm 23. We rejoice in wine to gladden the human heart, oil to make the face shine, in Psalm 104. Kindred living together in unity are like precious oil upon the head, Psalm 133. These are all images of well-being, of joyful company, of hospitality. Oil is a sign of welcome. Oil is also used throughout scripture as a means of setting someone or something aside for a special office or purpose. For instance, 
David is plucked from whatever pasture he is in, tending his sheep, and a horn of oil is poured over his head, making him Israel's rightful king. That's from 1 Samuel 16. Oil is used not only to anoint Aaron and the other priests, but also as a way of consecrating certain offerings. In Leviticus 2 and Leviticus 8 and in others. Oil is a sign of holiness, which is another way of saying wholeheartedness for God. Oil is a sign being set apart for God's designs. So all these uses of oil begin to suggest something to us, someone to us. And as we consider the name by which we call Jesus, Christ, it finally comes together. Christ, which means Messiah, which means anointed one. Jesus, the anointed one. Could the oil possibly be Christ? Jesus is going away. What do we need as we await his return? We need Christ. Welcome to scripture as Zen Cone, bottomless paradox, full of mind-bending twists. In the absence of Jesus, we need Jesus to be ready knowledge, faith, love, to welcome him back. Of course, it's all a beautiful paradox if you think about it. We need Christ, whom we call the light of the world and who assures us that we are the light of the world. We need Christ who feeds us and nourishes us and who requires that we feed and nourish one another. We need Christ who makes all people welcome, and so we welcome all in his name, thereby welcoming him. We need Christ, the wholehearted one, who urges us to wholeheartedly for God. We need Christ if we're going to keep our lamps shining, if we people are going to be ready. I don't think we acknowledge this most of the time, but it bears saying, I think this is why we have the church. The church exists because we need Christ. Didn't Paul call the church the body of Christ? We need a place where we can practice feeding one another and welcoming one another. Not just the folks we know, but those whose faces and lives are strangers to us. We need a place where we can practice a challenging work of reconciliation. Reconciliation with family members, with church members, with politicians, with First Nations people, with strangers. I think we are particularly called to this work. The news last week was full of stories about the horrors of being committed the horrors being committed in Palestine, the refusal of Israel to observe a ceasefire in Gaza so civilians could safely head south and aid could be delivered, blaming politicians who are taking too long to get Canadians out of Palestine without really knowing the story. And there is growing animosity among Muslims, Jews, and Christians in Canada, the United States, indeed around the world. I find it really shocking. That's politics, and stuff happens. But do you know what? We are called to do something better, something higher. We are called to make peace beyond our personal comfort zones. We're called to be agents of reconciliation, beyond winning and losing and what will benefit us and which team we're cheering for. We're called to have Christ, and to let him dictate how we relate to one another. Because we're in it for the long haul. I was watching CBC's 11 o'clock news on Thursday night when they were presenting a story about homelessness in Vancouver. They showed some footage from 1986, and there before my eyes was the Reverend Barry Morris being interviewed on the street under the Georgia Viaduct. And next thing I know, there's Barry in studio looking almost the same, except now he has white hair instead of all brown hair. 
Barry has been a champion for the homeless, the hungry, the destitute for 37 years that I'm aware of. Must be longer than that, really. Barry's the person leading the United Church of Canada's fight for a guaranteed livable income for all. And on December 10th, International Human Rights Day, Barry's birthday, you'll find him standing on a corner in the downtown east side with a few friends holding up a banner encouraging people to fight for human rights. He is quietly and persistently amazing. Barry loves Christ. Every so often when I need to talk to him, Barry is off on a silent retreat somewhere, he seems to be, and when we offer Taze at St. Andrews, there's Barry sitting quietly in, a ro in the front row. He's always reading, praying, listening to keep his lamp filled with oil. Whether or not we live in Jesus' end time or our own, there is work to be done in this world and in this church, and we need Christ to help us accomplish it. The good news is the love of God will continue to appear in our lives in surprising and unexpected ways. Jesus Christ comes when Christian people live in hope and never give up. Jesus Christ comes when faithful disciples express, express love and compassion and work for justice. Jesus Christ comes when critically ill people know they are ultimately safe in God's love. Heaven breaks into earth when faithful women and men live in hope and give themselves to the work of the kingdom. We are called to be light for the darkness, to be nourishment and welcome for the stranger, to be wholeheartedly for God's purposes. With Jesus in our midst, we can keep our lamps burning and be ready for the great celebration. May it be so. Amen. I 
beautiful. Thank you. Please join me now for the prayers of thanksgiving and concern, and we'll end it going into uh, the Lord's Prayer. I'd like your response after each section. When you hear me say, God, in your mercy, please respond by saying, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God of life, you open our eyes on the world you love and show us your presence and your purpose. We see the wonder of your creation and the compassion you offer through friend and stranger. For these gifts, we give you thanks. We pray for those who cannot recognize these gifts and find themselves lost and alone. Open their eyes to your presence and our companionship. God, in your mercy, God of justice, you open our eyes on the world and show us struggle and conflict. We see the stressful times around us and the burdens many must carry. We pray for those whose businesses are struggling, for producers unsure they will receive a fair return, for workers uncertain about their jobs or looking for new work, for families feeling the stress of economic uncertainty. Open their eyes to new possibilities and open our eyes to ways we can support them. God, in your mercy. God of compassion, you open our eyes on the world and show us suffering and despair. We see the challenges for healthcare right around the world. 
We pray for communities struggling with AIDS, malaria, and chronic hunger, and for those nearby facing illness, delays in treatment, and uncertain outcomes. Give strength and energy to those who provide care. Encourage and hope to all who wait for healing. Open their eyes to your mercy and open our eyes to needs we can meet. God in your mercy. God of wisdom, you open our eyes on the world and show us its complexities. We see countries locked in old animosities and communities overwhelmed by fresh upheaval. We pray for those displaced by current conflicts and natural disasters. Open the eyes and ears of leaders to the suffering of their people and to solutions yet untried. And open our eyes to ways we can participate in resolving situations which, which break your heart and ours. God, in your mercy. And so now we pray that your kingdom will come among us, O oh God, in the words Jesus taught us. Present God, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we This morning, Ali Panahi, our St. Andrew's stewardship animator, has provided a three-minute video from Mission and Service about global education initiatives called Sending People to School Together. So let's watch it together. It's only three minutes. Sadly, it's a right too many can't access. Today, I am chatting with Patty Talbot, the team lead of Global Partnerships, about life-changing education initiatives that your mission and service gives support, and why your generosity matters so much. It's really good to have you here. I would love to start with a little bit of an educational moment. Um, can you tell me what the United Church of Canada does around uh, educational initiatives globally? As part of our engagement in global partnership, the United Church is in relationship with about 85 organizations around the world. And that's quite a variety, um, large and small, denominations, networks, associations, civil society organizations. And the first is in Zambia, Women for Change. Women for Change in Zambia knew that if children, particularly girls, could stay in school longer, all of society would benefit. So part of what they invited the United Church into was to support a bursary program that was all about providing bursaries to kids who wouldn't otherwise be in school. In another, another part of the world, Colombia, the popular center for communication, is all about working particularly with women, youth, and children 
in marginal urban communities and rural areas to gain communication skills. We often hear from partners how much they appreciate the United Church walking with them, accompanying them, supporting them, even inspiring them. And if you could reach out and speak to the donors, what should we know about uh, the educational initiatives globally? Change is difficult, but change is possible. Participating in, in, in mission and service together uh, gives us opportunities to reach out to each other. When Jesus said, I come that all may have life and have it abundantly, you know, for me that's about life. You know, that's about sharing the joys of life. You know, being able to celebrate together, to share food and music and, and opportunities to really celebrate what it means to be human together. I'm moved and left with these tremendous gifts by the work that, that the United Church of Canada and the Mission Service Fund is doing uh, in global partnerships. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alexa. Your gift for mission and service will help engage partners in mutual learning and shared blessings. So I invite you to give what you can today before you leave to support the... <laughs> before we... Um, what was I saying? I invite you to give what you can today to support the work of St. Andrew's United Church. And if you would like to, like part of your offering to go to mission and service, um, please indicate how much on your envelope. And the offering plates are at the back and the envelopes are in the pew in front of you. So let's sing our offertory hymn, What Can I Do? Give you a couple of minutes to stand up and find the, the uh, tune. It's in one, More Voices 191. So please stand as you are able. What can I do? What can I bring? What can I say? What can I say? I'll sing with joy. I'll say a prayer. I'll bring my love. I'll do my share. What can I do? faster and faster every time we sing it. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> it's one of my favorites. What can I do? God of abundance, we thank you for the gifts given to us this day. We ask that you receive them and bless them. May they enable us to serve the world in ways that inspire hope and to make your love known. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, her closing hymn is Though Ancient Walls, Voices United 691. If you would stand again and uh, find it in your book, we'll sing it.
Christ who mends us and the Spirit who brings us life bless you and sustain you in every challenge and commitment. Amen. Go now in peace. Go now in peace. May the love of God surround you
feeling I know so well I've got you under my skin I'd sacrifice anything come what might for the sake of having you near in spite of a voice that comes in the night and repeats, repeats in my ear don't you know little fool you never can win use your mentality wake up to reality but each time i do just the thought of you makes me stop before i begin cause i've got you under my skin the post loop from now on we're playing <laughs> Bye. Uh, that's right <laughs> mm, so are you new in town or are you just uh sort of I, I just moved back to uh, oh Sorry about your mother. When did she pass away? Uh, August 20th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah,